So tonight on Ask a Nurse Practitioner Live, what I want to talk about is fatty liver disease, actually. It is, last week actually, was um, Liver Disease Awareness Week. And liver disease is super common, um, especially in Canada. And um, and the really the highest and most common form of liver disease is fatty liver disease. Um, and so I, I do want to talk about it because I think it's important. Um, I think it's something that we don't talk enough, enough about. Um, and I think a lot of people either know somebody or have the diagnosis themselves. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll take uh, anybody else's questions live if anybody has any questions. So let's start it. So when we talk about liver disease, there's hundreds of different types of liver disease. And um, earlier in the week, I posted some information about what our liver does. Um, it's a, quite a remarkable organ in our body. It really is our internal filter has a lot of um responsibilities you know the in really interesting thing about our liver is that it actually can regenerate on its own and so you know when somebody has a uh, mass or something like that we can cut the liver almost in half and it will completely regrow on its own um, or if somebody needed a liver transplant we can take um you know part part of a liver and do that which is quite remarkable because there's no other organ in the body that can actually regenerate itself. Um, so I don't really want to go over all the information that I've already posted. Um, so go and take a look at those posts. I think it was yesterday or the day before I posted quite a lot of information about um, what uh, liver disease is, um, really what the trying to classify or make sense of the hundred different types and so it can be caused by genetics it can be caused by infections it can be caused by um environmental stuff you know so there's you know there's many different types of liver disease but by far the most common is fatty liver disease and so when we think about fatty liver disease it really is broken up into two different types the first is something called um, non-alcoholic fatty liver and and what that is is that you know when we think about um, the fat on our body I mean it can go anywhere right um, and so it can filtrate um, the liver and so when somebody has non-alcoholic um, fatty liver it what it means is that there's fat infiltrating the inside of the liver but it's not causing inflammation. So it's not affecting the function of the liver itself. And so many of us have that. Um, and how do we pick that up? Usually we pick it up incidentally because of an ultrasound. So if somebody goes in, sorry, if someone goes in for an ultrasound because they've had uh, left upper, upper quadrant pain and I'm looking to see if they have gallstones, that's generally when I end up picking it up. Um, and I'll see, I'll, it'll be reported to me on an ultrasound. Um, or if someone's had some sort of abdominal imaging or a CT scan for whatever reason, um, and if they comment on the liver, that's when we'll pick it up. So, you know, that in itself um, is nothing that we worry about because it's not affecting the functionality of the liver. Um, but it could lead to damage of the liver. Um, and so then the second type of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is liver disease that's causing inflammation of the liver that is not related to alcohol use. And so that's why we say it's non-alcoholic um, liver disease because um, when somebody has uh, liver disease because of alcohol, so um, they have inflammation and damage because of alcohol that could lead to cirrhosis, um, you know, we, we call that alcoholic liver disease. Um, so the, the second type is something called NASH, uh, N-A-S-H, which is non-alcoholic um, steatohepatitis. So hepatitis in itself just means inflammation of the liver. So when we think about hepatitis A, B, and C, um, these are caused by infections, okay? So hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. Um, and, 
you know, in this case, the inflammation is coming from steatio, which means it's a Latin word for fat. Um, so the fat that's infiltrating the liver is causing inflammation. And so, you know, how do we, you know, when do we pick that up really? And, and we pick that up when we do liver function on people. So blood work that checks their people's liver enzymes. And the most common times that we're doing that is when somebody is diabetic, when somebody is because of the medications they're on, that they're on. So I'll routinely check people's liver function if people are on drugs to lower their cholesterol. So things like statins, because that can affect your um, liver. I will do liver function if someone's complaining of left upper quadrant pain. I will do liver functions if somebody has a, a history of heavy alcohol use. Um, yeah, so there's a variety of times when I'm going to be doing now those tests. And generally, we come across this incidentally because most people do not have symptoms. Um, and so we will come across them having elevated liver enzymes, specifically AST and ALT. Okay. Um, and so then we end up going and generally doing imaging um, to check. Sometimes we go as far as doing something called a, a fibro scan if you're in a major city, which is um, sort of like an ultrasound that looks at, you know, how, how dense is your liver. So when liver disease progresses, it causes something called fibrosis. And what fibrosis means is that, you know, when we look at liver, and most of us have seen liver, um, in the grocery store, it's really quite porous and it's jiggly and it's bouncy, right? When it gets fibrous, it gets stiff. Um, and so a fibro scan is looking at the liver and seeing how stiff it is because that is an indication of severity of disease. Um, and depending on that, when it becomes quite severe, it could lead to cirrhosis and cirrhosis is liver failure. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we think about fatty liver disease being, okay, everybody has it. Um, it's not that big of a deal. It, it, it rarely becomes serious, but what we're realizing is it can. Um, and we do really need to be screening people, screening the um, stages of it, depending on how elevated their uh, liver enzymes are, um, kind of staging it and following it up. Some people, it will never progress. Um, but some people it will. And so when we think about, you know, if somebody was to have symptoms, so if they were um, coming in and they were complaining of, you know, fatigue, unexplained weight loss, um, generalized weakness, belly pain, um, you know, then we would be doing a workup for a variety of things, um, you know, specifically to rule out cancer, but those things would include liver enzymes. When we think about, um, you know, how do we treat it or who is at risk? What we know is that people with type 2 diabetes are at higher risk. Um, about like over 50% of people with type 2 diabetes um, have fatty liver. Um, they may not have um, NASH, so the inflammation associated with it, but they're at very high risk for it. Um, people who have, um, you know, are that are overweight or bigger bodied, um, they are definitely at risk. Anybody that has metabolic syndrome is at risk for um, potentially developing NASH. And so when we think about metabolic syndrome, metabolic syndrome is... Um, people who have a large waist circumference. So specifically in men, it's over 40 inches. In women, it's over 35 inches. Um, we don't use um, BMI or the scale to determine metabolic syndrome. We know that waist circumference is much more accurate in its relation to um, cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk. The other thing is, is these people generally have 
um, they might not be diagnosed with hypertension. They may just have a higher than normal blood pressure. So a blood pressure of over 130 on 85. They may have been diagnosed with um, high blood pressure. They also have borderline high cholesterol. Um, specifically triglycerides, which is the worst of our cholesterol, or our LDL. Um, they also have borderline high sugars. So they're either pre-diabetic, um, in that pre-diabetic range. So when we think about like who's at risk for metabolic syndrome, certainly anybody as we age is at risk. Anybody that is carrying extra weight is at risk. Um, there's definitely certain... Um, ethnicities that are at higher risk. So people who are First Nations are at higher risk. Um, per people who are um, Hispanic, people who are Asian are at higher risk. Um, people who have a family history of uh, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol are at risk. Um, people who have had gestational diabetes in their uh, so which is diabetes in their pregnancy is are at higher risk of metabolic syndrome and higher risk of um, metabolic syndrome also increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes um, later on in life um, people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome um, because they have insulin resistance um, are at higher risk of metabolic syndrome as well um, and so these are all things that put us at risk of having fatty liver disease. Um, and so really, you know, what can we do about it, right? So certainly reducing your cholesterol is important. And so Lori is just saying, well, that's me. High cholesterol, type two, fatty liver, God, I'm doomed. No, no, you're not actually, Lori, because you take really good care of yourself. You are managing your risk. We've talked about this before. A lot of your risk is genetic, right? Um, and so you are managing your risk by having a really good exercise regime, watching what you're eating, um, you know, and those are, those are the important things, right? Um, you are managing your risk the best that you can. We have to re we have to remember that there's genetics involved that we can't change, right? Um, and because of your background of being First Nations, it puts you at a higher genetic risk to develop this, especially because you um, aren't typical of you know, if we were to say, you know, what does a type two diabetic look like? Um, you're not typical of that, right? Um, and so there, there's genetics in play. So I don't think you're doomed. I think that you're managing your risks very well by living a healthy lifestyle. And I commend you for that because um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and, you, and you do it very well. So when we think about how do we treat this, um, if you are diagnosed, you know, we want to manage our cholesterol. How do we do that? So we sometimes we have to do it with medication other times we can do it by adjusting our diet right um especially in people who are eating a lot of processed fast food um high saturated fats we can um look at having a cleaner diet so um you know we do want good fats fats are really important they are required for a lot of our body functioning so things like avocado oils and um, olive oils and olives and there's lots of ways we can get really good fats. We want to stay stay away from things that are deep fried, processed, um, you know, high in sugar and flour, those types of things, right? So we want we do want to look at you know what is our um, what, what is our uh, nutrition? You know that that is important. Increasing whole grains um, can help to decrease our. Um, cholesterol so adding oatmeal to your diet is a really great way of decreasing your cholesterol sometimes adding omega-3 fatty acids to our diet whether it's increasing your amount of salmon or sardines or those types of things fish um, into your diet or taking a supplement can can be helpful exercise exercise is an incredible way to to decrease your cholesterol um, even if you don't you know so it's a it's a great healthy habit even if it doesn't change your weight. And this is what's important. So many of you know I come with a view of, um, or from the perspective, perspective of, um, from an eating disorder lens. And I really believe in healthy habit formation. And if that changes our weight, 
that is great. But, you know, striving for weight loss in by restrictive diets, by um, excessive exercise, by um, extreme measures, I, I don't believe in that. I really believe in instituting healthy habits. So, um, you know, clean diets, getting exercise, um, getting good sleep, because um, when we don't have restful sleep, we tend to crave more carbohydrates, we tend to eat more, um, we're less active, uh, these things are really important. So looking at um, healthy habits that may decrease um, our overall weight without really looking at, I, I hate BMI, you guys have heard me say this, um, it's not an indicator of health. Um, you know, our, the scale in itself is not an indicator of health. Um, it is also not an indicator of our worth, um, which is really important because I think many of us step on that scale and associate our worth to that number and we, sh we really shouldn't do that. Um, right now with COVID-19, you see a lot of memes out there saying, are you going to be the one that gains X amount of weight during this isolation or not? Those memes are incredibly triggering for somebody who has an eating disorder um, and scarcity of food in the um, grocery stores also can be an incredible trigger for eating disorders for people who have, um, you know, this is a time of great anxiety and fear for many people. Um, and so for many people with eating disorders, um, this, that fear and uncertainty and anxiety can trigger their eating disorder, whether that is restriction, whether that's binging, whether that's purging or whatever. Um, and so um, I ask you um, to be very cognizant about what you post on social media about the COVID-19 weight gain, weight loss, diet, whatever you want to do, because um, you never know who's looking at um, and may see that and may be triggered by that. Um, so, you know, healthy habits that, you know, when we think about um, decreasing our, our weight, um, our overall improvement in our health can occur with just losing three to 10% of our body weight. So if we're 250 pounds, 10% of our body weight is, is 25 pounds or, and 3% of that is, you know, 10 pounds, right? Um, which is very manageable, right? Um, and so it is, uh, you know, when we're thinking about healthy habits, you know, that's something that's, that's attainable. When we're saying to somebody who's 250 pounds, like I was, um, that I need to be 130 to be a normal BMI, it's overwhelming, right? Many of us can't even begin to fathom that in our heads because in our adult lives, we've never ever been that weight. Um, and so, so yeah, so, you know, the, I'm, uh, the reason why I'm even bringing it up is so that you understand how small of an increment of weight loss that is that can have a, a significant impact on our overall health and wellness. Um, certainly if you're diabetic, managing your diabetes, making sure your sugars are well controlled is important. Um, if you drink alcohol, um, you know, cutting back, you know, when we think about normal, um, alcohol consumption for women, it's no more than one drink per day, um, less than eight to 10 drinks per week. Um, in men, it's, uh, less than two drinks per day and less than 14 drinks per week um, is what we consider uh, a normal healthy alcohol consumption. We consider binge drinking as more than four drinks in a sitting, which is really interesting because most people who go out, I mean, usually have more than four drinks, right? Um, and so we really have to um, watch that because the majority of people in my experience, living in rural Canada, um, whether that's rural Saskatchewan or rural Ontario, um, come from the mentality of work hard, play hard. Um, and so there's a lot of alcohol consumption. Um, and we have to be careful on how that um, translate on, translates on our liver health. Um, the other thing is regular exercise. You know, I've said this before, exercise is not gonna help you lose weight. Um, exercise is really good for a lot of things, right? for um and the reason why i say 
uh, if you've never heard me say this before, the reason why I say it's not going to help you lose weight is because um, if you are not a regular exerciser and you decide you're going to overhaul your health and wellness and you're going to change your meal plan and you're going to start exercising, exercising will deplete your willpower um, because it's not inherent. Um, and so you're having to force yourself to do that um, and you're doing that when you've cut calories significantly um, and so it's a hard thing to balance so when we look at their literature and the research um, there's nothing out there that's saying that exercise will help you lose weight um, it will however improve your mood improve your cardiovascular status improve your um, uh, prevention of alzheimer's and dementia um, help with uh, mobility and balance which are all incredibly important it'll help with prevention of osteoporosis I mean oh my god the literature on exercise as a benefit to our health is huge right um, and so doing so is important um, but we can't underestimate the thing is is you can't exercise enough to counteract a poor meal plan um, right there's no amount of running that is going to, um, you know, <laughs> compensate for you eating, um, you know, a, a really poor diet, right? Like we just have to be honest with ourselves, right? We're, we always make choices, right? Um, and it's the same thing goes that like no handful of supplements or vitamins is going to counteract um, a poor diet. Right. It's we just have to be honest with ourselves. I mean, we got to put the hard work in. None of us want to do it. It's hard. You have to do it every day. Um, and it's habits. It's about changing things by one percent. And I've talked about this before. Um, so, yeah, so that's fatty liver disease in a nutshell. Um, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to put some questions in the comments below. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah, fatty liver disease, I want to say is, oh, it's so, I don't know what the stat is, but it's huge. Um, I want to say that I see it a lot in my practice. So I'm going to tune off. I will see you guys on Sunday for our, um, Oracle card readings and, um, weekly guidance. If you guys need anything, you know where to find me, reach out. Um, you're never alone. Uh, I'm here for you to support you in whatever way I can. Um, it is the best way that I can be of service during this time. And uh, yeah, I will keep posting and letting you know the, um, yeah, knowing how I'm doing and the new reflections and everything that I'm learning, learning during this time. So thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon.